Mr. Kemperer, as we listen to your noble recording of the opening movement of Beethoven's Third Symphony, I recall you at the age of 75 as the greatest living conductor of Beethoven. But I want to take you back a bit. Can you remember in your boyhood the occasion when you first made your mind up that you would like to be a musician? It is nearly unnecessary to ask a musician where he comes from. Most all the musicians come from the East, from Russia, from Poland, from Hungary. I come from Poland, but in the time of my birth, uh, Breslau, the city where I am born, was a German town, the capital of Silesia. Today, it is called Wroclaw, a Polish town. And how old were you when you wanted to be a musician? My parents uh, went away when I was four years to Hamburg. And there I visited the school I had my whole childhood in Hamburg. And do you remember when you first thought of yourself as a musician? I, it was very early. When I uh, was six years, my mother gave me piano lessons. She was a professional piano teacher in her maiden time. And I made some progress, but I was very uh, not good, so uh, like a bad child. And therefore they took a teacher who was strict with me and uh, it was then all right. And at first I was always very much interested in the theater. And so I thought I become an actor. I will not become, they all said I shall become a musician. I said no, from my, when I am free, then I become an actor. That was my idea. but. Uh, Fortunately, with 16 years, I left to school. That was Real Gymnasium, and with, uh, with 16 years, one had to write for the, I don't know about in English, Einjährig Freiwilligendienst in the Army, in yes. German. One had not to stay longer in school. And then I went to the conservatory in Frankfurt. At first, I took a lot of piano lessons with the Dutch pianist James Quas and Ferry with a good teacher Ivan Knorr and I, I was so happy to be there and to be out of school because I hated the school. You were no good at school at anything except yes, music. Yes, I was you good, were. but I did not feel good at school. What, do you remember what were your favorite subjects at school? My favorite subject were, was history. Yes. History, languages, Latin and uh, French and English, but not uh, zoology and mathematics. I didn't care for that. Have you spoken English all your life? No, I learned it in school. Yes. And no, I have occasionally when I was in America, naturally, and uh, in England later. Then I spoke English, so my English is very uh, incomplete, I must excuse. You still don't think in English, you still have no, to translate. No, no, yeah. I, I make it, uh, the traduce. Uh, yes, you translate as yes, you go, yes. yes. Were you, in your boyhood still, were you a very serious-minded little boy or were you frivolous? No, I was I pretty serious, I yes. think. And I, at first, I... Uh, also, I exercise the piano uh, maybe eight hours every day, so I intended uh, to become a pianist, and I became it. I learned also a little violin, but only a little bit. And after one year, my teacher went to Berlin, and I went with him. And uh, the next four years, I was in Berlin studying music. And when did you first decide that you'd like to be a conductor? Always. <laughs> I decided always, but uh, I had a very amusing occasion. In 1905, 1906, Max Reinhardt gave the Orpheus in the Unterwelt of Offenbach. Yes. And he engaged 
Oscar Fried, uh, at that time very famous conductor, uh, to conduct it. And there was some trouble between him and the first singer, and I conducted it for 50 evenings. I was very proud. Then I, it was decided that I became conductor. And how old were you then? Um, 21. 21, yes, yes. Uh, and that was that was your actual first experience of conducting. That was it? my. I'm no, but there was some experience in the conservatory. I conducted the orchestra of the conservatory, yes. but only minor uh, things. And then my greatest impression in, at that time was the conductor Mahler. Ah, I heard him conduct in Vienna. Uh, his uh, the. Barkyrie and a game there in Aulis, and the concert, it was wonderful. It was very, very great. Today they speak always of the, um, of the enormous greatness of Toscanini. I assure you, Mahler was much greater. Well, now I want to ask you about Mahler. When did you first meet him? In Berlin, when Oskar Fried conducted the second symphony, and I had the honor to conduct uh, the little orchestra behind the stage. And then I met him. And then I made a piano transcription of his, uh, for two hands, of his second symphony and showed it to him in Vienna. And he gave me a recommendation, very good recommendation, which I have still today, uh, and uh, which opened me all doors. He was my, my, Spiritus Rector. He was uh, very good to me. And this was the beginning of a friendship with him which lasted. Friendship is a little uh, big word. Uh, uh, I came then by his recommendation to Prague as a real conductor. And I stayed there for three years. Then I went also by his recommendation to Hamburg. And I stayed there also about three years. Then came a little intermission in Barmen, in the Wuppertal. I was one year, and then I came to Strasbourg. So uh, three years, and it came to Cologne. Seven years there, I married a singer, my wife, and we had the two children. One is there over there, and the boy is in, in California, in Los Angeles. No, and then came 93, 33. Yes, quite. And then I was forced to go away. But before that, I want still to ask you just a little more about Mahler. Did you see him often? Not often, but uh, pretty often. I saw him when uh, he conducted in Prague. I saw him in the evening in this hotel. And I saw him in Munich when he conducted also his Eighth Symphony. I saw him in this hotel. It was always very, very interesting. Now, at one time, at any rate, you conducted a great deal of Mahler's work. Yes. Uh, I think it's true to say that lately you have not, in London at any rate, yes. conducted Mahler nearly so often as you used to. I tell you, this is a misunderstanding. I have not changed at all. I think at the, in the same way about modern music as I did in 1933, but uh, the state Staatstheater in Berlin was subsidized by the state, and it was not important whether the box office was so or so. So I could also do works of modern type which had no success. And here it is otherwise. The Philharmonia is a private orchestra, and I have to consider the box office in making programs. I try my best to uh, to do this and this, which uh, is not when I do always, for uh, instance, I did the Bruckner, and at the same evening, I did another more popular work. Yes, quite, quite. The, and, please? The, the, there are two of you. Just one, one more question, if I may, yes. about Mahler, and then, then we'll move on. There, there, there are two people in the world who I think are generally recognized as having special authority to conduct Mahler at the moment, because you were both his, his, his pupils in the no, old days, Bruno, true, Bruno no. Walter and, yeah, and yourself. Yeah. Now, if one listens to Mahler conducted by Bruno Walter yeah. and then conducted by you, it might be two quite different composers. And I wonder why it is that, you, that what 
differences there are because you both knew Marla. Marla is a uh, very good conduct, and, uh, but he is an absolutely other character than I am. You see, uh, it's, uh, it's difficult to speak about this, but you see, he is very uh, conciliating and very elegant and very mild, and I am not. And he's very romantic. Very romantic. I am not at all. And he is what we call, but um, you, uh, not misunderstand, he is a moralist. I am an immoralist. Absolutely. And this is an immoralist version of my <laughs> listen to. Yes. <laughs> well, now, when you then went afterwards to Berlin, first to the Kroll Opera and then, then, and then uh, afterwards we to the went State in Opera. the first shock, we went all to Zurich in Switzerland and to Vienna because I hoped the Hitler invasion would stop in Germany, not go to Austria. Then I saw that he came to all America, very grateful to America because they gave me and my family bread and work. Did you like the American way of life? No. What, what, what do you like, if you think of America now, what do you like most about life in America? The orchestras are very good. I mean, the Namdi, the orchestra in the East, the Boston, Philadelphia, Philharmonic, New York, is very good, uh, the best in the world. But uh, I don't like the, the dollar, always the dollar, the dollar, that is not good. Uh, do you like the comfort of American living? Yes, yes. But it was the same in Germany. Yes. No. No, you, because, because you, in fact, lived in Los Angeles, did you not, for a long at time? At first, uh, I became musical director of the Philharmonic Orchestra in Los Angeles. Then, uh, that was in 33. And then in 39, they came very ill. I had a brain tumor. And it was necessary to operate it in Boston. And fortunately, it became better, but in the whole year I was out of my work. And then I did not get again a musical director, of the, I was guest conductor in the whole world. Yes. Uh, tell me, you took American citizenship in the end. Yes. Why did you do that? Because I hate Germany. <laughs> I was so furious about this uh, attitude against us, against born Jews, that I naturally took American citizenship, but I gave it up. Ah, I was going to ask you, you have given it up. You see, in 54, we went to Europe, and I was undecided whether I should go back to America or stay in Europe. But then I find, found out that every two years, one must come and stay a little bit in the United States every two years uh, back and forth and it was too expensive. So I uh, said to German authorities, I will become German again, they were very happy. And in three days it was all right. And now I have a passport where I can travel wherever I want. Yes. Or to, to Budapest or to Moscow, I can travel. But you are a German citizen now. I'm a German citizen. And, and where do you live? Huh? Where do you live? In Zurich. In Zurich. I am a, uh, what, we, what they call in Germany, Auslandsdeutscher. Yes. I am a German who lives in, in uh, foreign countries. Yes, quite. Uh, do you, in fact, especially now you're getting on in years, do you enjoy the life of perpetual travel, which being a conductor... No, not at all. You must live a lot of your time in hotels and no, trains. No, I, I like... Not here. I, mean, I have a very agreeable situation in the Hyde Park Hotel. We have uh, three rooms and we live like in a private house. But uh, generally, I like to be on one place for the whole season and not to travel. But occasionally I must do it. Do you, in fact, uh, care very much about your physical surroundings, about comfort? Not so well, no. no. If I have my bed and my chair and my music paper, then I am happy. If I ask you what place you think of now as being home, is it Zurich or is it Germany? Is it America? You see, 
this is my home where I can work at best. So my second fatherland is really England. But I go in vacation time, I go back to Zurich. And that's very good for the resting and so. But it is necessary for an artist to have some time of relaxation. You cannot always work. Quite. And for this you find Zurich is where you always go. very good. Yes. You see the German, German country and my wife uh, absolutely wished to live in a German country. And in Germany I uh, refused to, give, uh, to go back. And so Switzerland, what Austria is very far in the east, is not very good. And uh, Zurich was right. Yes, and so it is very nice. Yes. You know it? I do indeed, yes. It is a nice place. Yes. yes. It's a big lake and uh, pretty good, many trees. And in the summertime we go always up in the mountains to the Engadin, to St. Moritz. And that is wonderful, it's unique. Now, in the last 20 years, since 1939, you've had a series of illnesses yes. and accidents. You told us just now about yeah, this misfortune of the brain tumor. To, uh, you in, fractured your hip. In, yes, my hip in 51. And the most serious event was that in 50, I think 58, I, ha I was burning third degree. It was really, uh, my life was in big danger. Well, you I were, didn't know it. No, you were over 70 and you were very badly burned. Very badly. Now, uh, do you think you're what, is what the psychologists call accident prone? H mm. How did this burning happen, for instance? How did it happen? <laughs> I was, uh, I went to bed and took my pipe. And, and some, I don't know, but then it came together with the wood of the curtain and uh, and then I had on my uh, on my night table a little bottle of alcohol because I had little pain and there I and I thought with alcohol the fire will out, be out but in contrary it was very high and then I was pretty lost and then my daughter waked by accident and she came in my room and all the covers she you were in out. flames was happy. Did you at that time, or after any of those illnesses, believe that you would perhaps never come back to conducting again? No. You always were sure that you would? Yes, I hoped always. Yes. Since your brain tumor and your fractured hip and your burning, you have been slightly physically handicapped. Now, has this been a great disadvantage to you in conducting? For no, instance, you never hold a baton nowadays. Yes. No, I did it also before these accidents. But it is just the same. Whether one can conduct with the hand, and mostly one conducts with the eyes. So you see? And uh, sitting, my goodness, in the opera, the conductors are always sitting. And the concert is not to have it. But it's just the same. One doesn't conduct with the legs. One conducts with the arms and with the eyes. That's the most important. Yes. Do, do you, uh, are there any works now that you find for reasons of fatigue or one reason and another you can't do justice to? No, I don't hope. I don't hope. No, quite. Quite. Do you enjoy conducting in London with the Philharmonia? Yes, very much. Because this orchestra is my, all my joy. At first, the orchestra has really developed, although it was very good five years ago, still developed. We have a, a lot of new people there, and they are very good, and they are very good to me. So I am also very good with them. They play better for you than for anybody else. <laughs> they play very good for me. What would you say, is there any general remark you would make about the weaknesses of English orchestral playing? No. All the orchestras in London, LSO and Philharmonic and Reuven, are very good. 
Uh, the trouble in Philharmonia is that they have no real contracts. I mean that they are not a permanent. They are freelancing, but they come always. Does this mean it's difficult to get them for rehearsal? No, it is not difficult, not at all. What about English audiences who demand that you keep on playing the classics? They don't demand it. They don't demand it. Uh, yes, they love the classics very much, but I can also, in the last concert, I played a piece of Bartok, it's a modern composer, they liked it very much. And you see, English people and English audiences are very fair. And that is the best one can say. Yes. You, you told me, however, a few minutes ago, that you found it more difficult to play uh, Stravinsky, Hindemith, yeah. uh, Janacek, and the people yeah. you used to play in Berlin, because in Berlin your, your orchestra was subsidized, yes. and here it's a private I enterprise would. orchestra. Yeah. Now, this must mean that the public does not like to hear these modern composers. That's true. Um, um, the, you know, the other composers are more sure. Yes, quite. There one has, one knows if there's the fifth of Beethoven and uh, uh, the first symphony of Brahms, it's all, always sold out. But with modern composers, you don't, you don't know. But it comes, it comes. When did you last play, let us say, Hindemith in London? Hindemith. Bit of it. I think it was a long time ago. Yes, very long time. I think I, I was not whether I played, I don't know whether I played it, but I made the recordings of, of one piece um, of Hindemith. Um, Matisse? I don't know the name, not Matisse, yeah. um, another piece, but a very good piece. I made the recordings. Okay. Yes, yes. Well, now, let me ask you, just in the last few minutes of this conversation, yeah. a little more about yourself personally. When you're not in the concert hall, when you're not yeah. with music, yeah. what are your relaxations? Do you read? Yes. Well, what, what do you enjoy reading? Always the same. <laughs> well, what? <laughs> I mean, uh, I read again and again Goethe and Shakespeare and Heine. At most, I must tell you, always, and also if I am very tired, I like to read Nietzsche. That's my favorite uh, writer. I think he's wonderful. Do you read Shakespeare in English? No, in exactly. German. What is your favorite play of Shakespeare? Uh, um, no, the Tempest. Now, I wonder why. Can you tell me very shortly why The Tempest appeals to you so much? Oh. It's tranquility. The Tempest is... is uh, second Midsummer Night's Dream, it's uh, very fantastic and it's, it is not a tragedy and it's not a comedy, but it is a wonderful mixture of them both. Uh, do you go to other people's concerts? Yes. Do you yes. enjoy that or do you find it almost no, intolerable no, no. to listen to? No, no. Uh, I am glad to find out. I will go uh, Tuesday to the concert of Marseille. They all told me he's a very talented conductor. I never heard him, and I am very interested to hear him. What is sometimes said about you by other people is that you go to a concert and then walk out in the middle of it. Is that true? Yes. Why do you do that? <laughs> well, it doesn't please to me. Uh, I went out in the uh, in Covent Garden. I heard Sonambula. Ah, I thought this is terrible for me. Uh, Bellini is a great composer, but his Norma is a great work for Sonambula. She also went out in the first act. Anybody uh, looking at you, standing, conducting an orchestra, yeah. would say that you were a man of tremendous self-discipline and, and strong will, and yet your life suggests that perhaps you're a much more turbulent character underneath than appears on the surface. Do you in fact have strong feelings of anger and affection? Oh, not at all. Did you when you were younger? Yes. 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 Then I did. Um, you, now you're 75 years old. Is there anything else quite new that you'd like to do that you haven't yet done that you'd like to do before you I die? Uh, I have composed my whole life. 
and I do it today as I do it 60 years before. And I have very few works published. There's a mass published by Schott in Mayence and some songs, but I hope it will become more. Would you like to be remembered as a composer? Yes. Have you found deeper satisfaction as a composer? Yes. Is there anything in your life, looking back, that you really regret? Something you've missed? Everybody has um, some things to regret. Everybody. Every human being. But generally, it was all right. Dr. Klemperer, let me ask you just as a last question. Yes. Have you have you had a happy life and are you a happy man today? Yes. You see, I am in nature, I am very much up and down. Up and down. And between these two is naturally very difficult. But generally it is all right. And this up and down is thanks to God less in the last years because then I'm older, perhaps I'm more quiet and so.